Good afternoon, everyone. Apologies for the delay. We are quickly letting everyone into the meeting. How you doing, huh? Okay, I'm just making making an email to Manny. Is your camera working and everything? My camera. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mikkel Adgate. I am Acting Deputy Commissioner for Public Affairs and Communications here at T DEP. Thank you so much for joining us for our um, third advisory group meeting. I apologize for the delay in kicking off. Um, we do have a presentation for you. And I think, Brian, if you are in, you can pull that up now. Um, and I, I want to hand it over to Angela Lakata, our Deputy Commissioner for Sustainability to um, kick us off this afternoon. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Mikhail, and welcome everyone. We're really happy um, to have this meeting opportunity with you. Um, you've asked us some specific questions and we'll jump into that. But first, I just want to acknowledge all of our changes um, internally. Uh, we have a new mayor, obviously, um, and we have now a new commissioner, Rit Agrawala, um, which is really exciting. And he's already indicated his willingness to be very supportive of the work that we're doing. Um, he also has a dual role, which is that he will also be overseeing the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. And I don't need to tell each of you that there's a lot of overlap and a lot of coordination that already takes place between the DEP and that office. And a lot of our issues are certainly intermingled. So we look forward to working more collaboratively with them. I think this is a really exciting time um, to be looking forward to receiving um, some federal money and federal support for the work that we do and also to be looking um, through the environmental justice lens at how we spend that money, most importantly. So again, I just want to acknowledge those changes um, and let you know how enthusiastic we are about them. Um, also, we recognize that there's been a lot of changes at the City Council. So welcome to new council members and their staff um, as well. And today's meeting will be a little bit different than the others because you've asked us to take a really um, deeper dive into the way in which DEP collects revenues today and then sort of our financial structure, our relationship with the New York City Water Board, New York City um, Water Finance Authority. And so for that reason, we have invited Omar Nazim who is the treasurer of the New York City Water Board and um, all things knowledgeable about these types of questions that you may have. But please let Omar get through his presentation and then we will certainly open it up to the group. So Omar, the stage is yours. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Omar Nazim, as Angela mentioned. Um, just a, a quick 10 second background on me is I, I've been with the Water Board since 2016. Uh, I joined in the springtime of that year and participated in the fiscal year 2017 rate setting and have been part of the budget and rate setting process each year since uh, fiscal year 2017. Uh, I came to the city from a, a financial background. I've worked for a series of banks and asset management companies in a, a variety of roles. And in 2016, I moved away from that and joined um, the board. The board we'll talk about more in a second, but I think sometimes people are a little confused that the board is an independent entity. Um, it's created by state law. It's a public authority, as many of you will be familiar with, but it, we're housed at DEP. We sit in the offices of DEP, the utility company. We're sort of in the middle of, we're on the eighth floor of the DEP headquarters building. And if you walk around, we're, we're in my view, indistinguishable from DEP employees. So although we, we work on, the water board and we talk about work on water rates and we run the public process and do all the questions and answers and documents and administration 
around that, we, we look and feel a lot like utility um, company employees. And I think that captures of how we how we work with DEP. I, I view it as almost as part of DEP in terms of our integration and our you know our you know probably dozens of times a day interactions with um, the utility company. So I, I view them as partners. I view us as you know, essentially a city agency, um, a very much part and parcel of the city fabric and the utility company. So although we are a state public authority, we we look a lot like a city agency, and we in fact sit in a city the offices of the city agency. Um, so Brian Lamberta is um, has offered to help um, flip the slides today. Um, so I, I am I am an expert Microsoft Teams user, but not an ex expert Zoom user, since most of what we do is over Microsoft Teams. So Brian has generously helped um, offered to help flip the slides. So Brian, can we, can we flip to um, what, what is number to slide number five, the system diagram? Do you have do you have the screen share up? Are folks able to see that? Yes. Okay. Can see it. All right. Thank you. All right. So the what we have so slide five is sort of it's sort of a nerdy like like almost kind of process flow diagram. But I I, I, I we're not going to talk about most of the boxes on this. But what I, I did this to this is a little different how we show the system usually. I did this to try and show the three pieces of it that we're going to talk the most about today which are the piece in the green box, the water board, and then the pieces in the center right below that with the blue and red text, the, the DEP, which is the utility company that runs the system. And then the water authority, which is the sort of sister public authority that was created by the city to sell bonds to Wall Street investors. Those three pieces are really the key of the money side of how the utility company works, how budgets are set, how rates are raised and how we think about how, how we want to establish rates and charges and how we want to do the budget, and how we want the money to flow between the three different pieces. Now, it, it, as, as you would guess in a, a system as large as ours with $40 billion of assets on the books and you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of land and tens of thousands of different water and sewer assets, you can't run that all without being very much tied in to a lot of other arms of the city. And I, I won't go through all of them, but as, as you would expect, City Hall and the mayor are hugely important. City Council plays a very important role. The budget office, the law department, and DDC, you in each case have employees who are basically full-time partners on running the water system. Uh, we have a huge range of private sector partners, um, engineering companies, advisory companies, banks, law firms who work on everything we do. And then of course we have the public that votes and provides input to um, you know, all the different things we do, in particular water rates through the public process that the board runs. But those, those three pieces I have, have in the center of this diagram, the board and the DEP and the authority are kind of the three pieces at the core of that. Um, they were kind of put together in 1984 with a law that took effect in 1985. And the, the board and the authority were created kind of out of whole cloth at that time as new entities kind of specifically geared toward handling the money and the Wall Street relationships for the water system. And it was done that way for a bunch of reasons, but the main ones were after the 1970s when the city's financial prudence had come into question, the thought was to kind of silo different pieces of the city's money. And in particular, the water revenues are a sort of classic type of cash flow that you can package up and issue discrete bonds against which is an attractive thing to do because water systems uh, under, you know, if you think about it, kind of underlie practically everything a city does and they got to work or else you have a problem and they are hugely capital intensive. It takes huge amounts of money to build and maintain and run a water and sewer system. So the thought was to kind of get the revenues, you charge people to use the system, match those to the payments you got to sell on the bonds, use the bond money to build the stuff and maintain the stuff. And you have kind of a closed loop of money with the city kind of hardwired into it, both through state law, through city council um, involvement in certain areas, and through commercial contracts that really kind of you know, cemented it together in a in a way that has worked well. And I mean, it continues to work well. You know, we're, we're you know, 40 years later, basically, and the system still kind of has that structure, and it's you know been an attractive thing for investors and for the city in terms of constructing and running a, a large, complicated city. So, Brian, can we go into slide six now? So slide six, I, I won't 
bore you all this, but the the if you're if you're curious about the state law authority because it is interesting, the sections of state law are sections 1045 and 1046 of the Public Authorities Law. Those created the entities out. You know, they were brand new de novo entities in 1985, and the statute that goes through and very specifically assigns all the duties and responsibilities to each of the components. And it's, it inscribes it in that legislative way, in a way that's very clear. It's a very short statute. It's a succinct statute. It could not be more clear about who does what. And it's it's very, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, if you read a lot, if you read state statutes, it's a very helpful statute. It's, kind of, it's, it's easy to understand and interpret. Um, that from the water board perspective, the things that most significantly did are, it places an absolutely affirmative duty. You gotta go out and set rates. That's your job as a water board. It gives us a very broad discretionary, kind of, blanket to do that. Um, it, we're not subject to regulatory oversight by any of the state agencies that often do oversee utility rates. It's kind of you put on the city's you know, arms as a responsibility. And okay, the, the way public involvement occurs is through a public process where the public you know, comes and gives testimony. They attend hearings. They can you know, speak, stand up and speak. They can send material in writing. They can grab us off to the side and discuss with us. Um, but there's no kind of agency review as there often is in the utility rate making world. Um, ultimately, if there's a disagreement about an individual billing matter, we have a process for that. But if there's a disagreement about fundamental rates and charges, and you don't get the involved, you don't get the response, you don't get the communication resolved through the public process. You have recourses to the court system, and the standard review is kind of a rational basis. You know, does it make sense? Is it fair? Is it not arbitrary? Standard review. But you got before that, it puts the entire responsibility on the board and gives the membership and the you know the professional staff who support them. Um, a very big responsibility and quite you know, broad, um, kind of broad guidelines in which to operate. Um, in financial terms, aside from kind of the general responsibilities that you guys got to be rational, it can't be arbitrary. Um, in terms of what the rates need to look like, it really you know the statute and the legal authority just says you got to raise enough to pay the utility company to run. To run, excuse me, you got to pay enough to you know, make sure the bondholders are kept whole on what's owed to them on the bond that's been sold. And you know, you can't charge too much that becomes unreasonable and excessive. But beyond that, you have a wide amount of discretion in terms of how much revenue is raised and almost complete discretion in how you want to kind of do the classic act of utility rate making and decide how much is apportioned to each type of property, what is the rate structure, what are the exemptions, what are the you know, customer you know, affordability benefits you want to give people, what are the subsidy rates or the incentive rates for small business, for example. Um, so it's an interesting statute, and it, it kind of, you cast the water board in this is very interesting kind of financial legal activity of utility rate making, um, which is you know, often the, the Jermaine State you know, administrative agencies, but in the case of the city of New York, it takes place right here in the city. Okay, um, so Frank, we go on to the next slide, please. So th this is a, a laundry list of all the different things that you can kind of weigh when you're doing utility rate making. Um, it, it, at the most simple level, it's, it's, it's basic arithmetic. Um, so we'll go through a later slide. You, you, you figure out what the utility company is going to spend. You figure out what the bondholders need to get paid. And that tells you you got to raise at least that much. But then you have about 50 other factors. I just have some of the ones here that you want to think about. Um, we, we, of course, take a multi-year outlook. We aren't just looking at the next year or even two years. We want to think about what's the profile of rate increases and revenues and expenses and debt service going to be over at least a 10-year horizon. Um, we run our capital plan on that basis. We run our internal financial models on that basis. And sometimes we even go further out and look at a 20 year exercise, which is sort of more of a theoretical thing, but it's useful to do. Um, it, you, you think about, okay, it, it's, it's, it's no different than you know, a business figuring out what do I want to you know, sell sneakers for, or a law firm, what do I want to sell legal services for? Um, you got to think about your costs. You got to think about you know, which customers you know, are, are doing what, where do you want to incentivize, where do you want to penalize, where do you want to kind of encourage changes in behavior, such as promote, promoting water efficiency. Then you have a huge list of external factors, which we have essentially no control over. Um, things like the economic condition, things like what's the rate of inflation, things like what's going on in the bond market. Is debt getting more, going to get more expensive to sell or less expensive to sell? Um, things like you know, what, what rate are we allowed to charge in overdue policies? Things like you know, how much discretion do we have to kind of pursue collection actions against customers overdue in the bills? Um, and then you know, just advice we get from the credit rating agencies and the law firms. So you have got basic arithmetic you know, triangulated against the fact you're trying to you know, come up with a reasonable rate profile and revenue um, path for at least a decade forward. And then you're trying to you know, triangulate with all these different constituencies. You saw on the first slide, all the different you know, people who have a say in how the system is run, um, the voting membership who ultimately decides, 
the public who's you know, in, who having an informed and involved public is essential and you, you want to get that input and weigh it um, as fully as you can. So it, it's a very challenging and interesting problem. Of ju so it's also a juggling act um, of all these different pieces to consider. And it, it can involve you know, a financial piece, a legal piece, um, a public piece, and you know, it's a lot of different aspects to balance between. So I think we go into the, um, the next slide, Brian. So this is um, slide eight. What we, we, this is in terms of just kind of how, you, how the arithmetic works and how you kind of think through how the rates get set. You're doing two things in parallel. You're you're working with it's, it goes back and forth. So the at the start of the budget of the rate setting process, we more work with the city's budget office and we figure out what's it going to cost to run DEP next year, the year for which we're going to make rates. The old budget office tells us a soft number initially, then after their budget gets approved, they certify it in writing, this is what we need. If you make, if you can get this for next year, if GEP is good and we're happy. Um, the next thing the, the city budget office has to think about is the rental payment. Um, this is a, an interesting kind of piece of the system. Um, the city owns and operates, it, it's the city owns practically the entire plant and equipment, as well as significant real estate outside the city used to kind of collect, convey, store, treat, and distribute um, water, and then to treat the wastewater and um, recycle it into kind of water bodies on the back end. And that, that's a huge blessing because that, that is a, just an unbelievable portfolio of operating assets bought and created over 150 years. And it's, it's a blessing the city has it all on this balance sheet. Um, a lot of it you couldn't rebuild today if you wanted to. Um, the, the, the way it's structured is, although the city owns the stuff, the board in effect rents it and has a leasehold on practically all of it. And it, it's done that way to make sure that the assets are available for utility purposes and that they're there and available to raise the revenues the board needs to make sure the utility company gets paid and to make sure the bondholders get paid. And it gives the board a right of review. If the city wants to sell something or to assign a property right on something, the board and the consulting engineer and the you know, myriad real estate attorneys we have here to got to take a look and they decide, you know, is this going to have an impact on the system's ability to raise revenues or to operate? It usually doesn't. Um, and if that's the case, then the city can you know, engage in real estate transactions. The board releases its leasehold. But that, that fact that the board has the ability to look at real estate deals and it has that assurance and guarantee that the property and, and plant and real estate it needs to run the system is gonna be available and unencumbered to support the revenue generation so the board can meet fiduciary obligations is essential. And that, that's why the rental payment exists. Um, the city has discretion whether it wants to request it or not. In recent years, um, because the you know, DeBasio administration policy put into place in 2016, the city generally has not requested it. Um, it has the option to, of course, and in past administrations it did. Um, it, it, but the, 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 re the reason of logic is because of that, that, kind of that arrangement where the board has the right of use and at least hold on property that the city still owns. So, after, so you got the so you go through the GEP operating expense piece. You go through the rental piece of the budget office. You go to the debt entity, the water authority, and the water authority is going to tell you what do we owe the bondholders next year contractually. All the bonds we've ever sold, they're still out there, and that we haven't get prepaid or made special arrangements for. What do you have to? Pay? What do you owe them next year? And the water authority will tell you the number. They certified in writing that becomes along with the rental and the DEP your operating costs the third key number in the calculation. Then the, the board and the authority of course have your running expenses themselves which are which are relatively small in the scheme of things but that goes into the calculation as well. Um, I mentioned we have private sector partners. Um, we have a rate consultant we work with who's been involved with us in, you know, in, in different capacities since 1985 and we work with that individual and his firm in we're doing that multi-year projection. You know, we take what we know we have to chart, what we have to recover next year through rates. And we think about what do we need to achieve in terms of policy, in terms of water conservation, in terms of customer outcomes, in terms of, kind of responding to public and electoral feedback around where customers might face affordability challenges, where there might be plumbing challenges, where they might, might, we wanna promote metering, for example, things of that nature. Um, we then have, go to be taking the rate consultant work and the arithmetic of what we've been told by our financial partners. We do that big long-term model and we kind of look at, you know, if you raise rates this much this year, what does it mean next year? And what does it mean in years from there? If you raise more this year, it usually means less in the future. If you raise less this year, it means more in the future. If you don't raise this year, it means you know, much more in the future, as you would expect. Um, 
and we, we can think about that. And then we weigh the non-economic factors and you know, just kind of the, the environmental factors and that laundry list of factors I, I described. Um, we then take, we kind of come up with a number and a, a viewpoint of what are the numbers going to look like last year? What does the board need to raise, you know, in terms of revenues? And we take it to our engineering consultants, um, which is another group we, you know, who've been associated with us for decades and decades. And they, they take a look at what the, rev, what the rate increase would mean in terms of revenues, and they do a due diligence process and they check, are you gonna raise enough money to actually maintain the system and run it effectively in the coming year? So the city's budget office tells you, this is what we need. We run it all through the process, but then that engineering company comes in the very end and they make sure that number is good. They make sure the city's not underfunding the system. They make sure that you've got what you need to pay for all the expenses that go into running a large utility company. If it's not sufficient, they're gonna come back and say, you need more, or if it is, they're gonna say, that's good. You can run you can run that rate increase and it's gonna be fine. Um, the last thing, and this is, this, all of this kind of happens behind the scenes before we really take it to the public. Um, the, the last thing that happens is we, um, DEP uh, comes to the water board usually in April or May of each year and they, they in a public meeting, stand up and say, here's where the numbers are. Here's what's happened in the last year. We need a rate increase or we don't need a rate increase and here's what it's going to mean for the customers and here's what the budget's going to look like then that kicks off the process that is visible to the people on, on this call where we post notice in the newspapers we run our five borough hearings we run another hearing upstate for a, we, we charge we sell water to customers outside the city as well and we kind of go through that large process where people come to the meetings they provide testimony they you know, you know, tell us what we're doing well, they tell us what we're doing badly, they tell us what they, we like to see um, done differently. And the water board takes all of that, the staff that helps them, we, we collate it all, we make sure all the questions get answered, we provide a big binder to the staff, or to the board's voting membership before they come back, um, usually in May or June. And then they held in a second public meeting, um, a discussion and a vote on whether they want to take the rate increase as proposed by DEP, or they want to do a different number, then they vote on that rate increase, they adopt a budget, all those rates go into effect July 1st, and then we repeat the cycle the next year. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a good process. It, it involves, it, it, I think we do a good job involving everybody. Um, we, we involve everybody as we, we can on the city side. We give the public a lot of opportunities to um, provide feedback. Um, the, the online, the shift to online meetings has actually been, um, interestingly enough, a, um, a boost for us in terms of public participation. Um, our, our meetings, kind of, you know, how well attended they are going cycles, but with these online meetings, we're, we're drawing 50 people a meeting now for our, our regular meetings, um, which is which is great for us. We we usually you know some of our meetings are not you know so well attended. Um, this meeting is you know a good example of that we have a, you know, a large attendance on this. So it's it's exciting to see people kind of paying more attention to what we do. It's um it can be very boring, but it's a uh, it's very important and interesting to us. We're happy to see people kind of uh, taking a look and um, digging in. Um, so Brian, can we go to the next next slide, slide nine? Um, th this one, th this is just, yeah, this is just a sample budget. This is, you know, the actual budget um, the board voted on and adopted last June, um, in June 2021, and it tied into our 2.76% uh, metered rate increase. Um, I mean, the, I, I won't go through it line by line, but you, you can see, you know, it's, it, it take, you know the, the biggest, the biggest item is the utilities running cost. The next biggest piece is the, what we owe the, the bondholders. And then we have, you know, smaller line items around administrative costs of the public authorities. Um, we have we set aside a certain amount of bu the budget to to engage in kind of debt management. So if we have a way to prepay debt on attractive terms, you know, we, we can you know sell a new bond cheaper. We can just you know, knock out an old expensive bond. We'll do that. Um, or we want to just not sell the bond at all and just pay cash to do construction. If we have a small amount of money in the budget that lets us do that. Um, also, one, one thing on this is a little confusing, but it's actually an interesting feature. Is if you look at how the bondholders get paid, we have this concept of rollover money. So at the end of each year, we end with some money in the bank. It's not a surplus. It's kind of a prepayment toward the next year's debt. So if you look at how the billion five, in this case, of or the, the round up a billion six, the sort of the bondholders gets paid, in the current fiscal year, you're paying a billion six of it using a billion dollars of leftover money from last year, plus 600 million of revenues from this year, and then you're rebuilding that billion dollar balance at the end of the year. And that's, the bondholders love that because it, just, it makes this, they know that there's two thirds of the money in the bank already to pay the debt at the start of the year. They love that fact. It makes the bonds easier to market. It makes them cheaper to pay. It gives us a little margin of safety. There's a hiccup. Um, it doesn't, there's, it's sort of not, not a surplus in a sense. It's got kind of, you know, a structuring choice around how you want to kind of give comfort to the bondholders. 
in the world of municipal finance and the ups and downs that you know you can see in the interest rate um, environment that you know there's the volatility that we all have to live with for Wall Street. So that, that's that's what that piece is about. It's um, a thing that we you built it up over time, over years, and it's um it's very attractive for the bondholder, of course, because it gives them additional security in terms of knowing that the money's there to pay um, what's owed to them. Uh, so we go to um, this slide ten. Um, th this is you know, the, the, the summary on this slide is you know, we 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 starting in the 90s we really got serious with the customers. You've got to install meters, and you got to you know, get a meter in there, and you got to get paid on metered bill. Or you got to get, you need to get charged based on how much water you use on a meter basis. And when you do it's it's, it's a no brainer when you do when you do that, the customers pay, if you charge a customer you know based on what they use in terms of the water they pay more attention to how much they use and become more water efficient. Um, we paired the meters over the years with wireless transmission, so we're able to collect the reads um, just using a citywide wireless network and go straight to the billing system. We don't have to knock on 840,000 doors around the city and try to get in anymore to read the meters. Um, so that, that's been you know a big you know a big boost to the system. Um, we have um, we have a minimum charge rate, which is if if you use around 90 gallons of water or less, you just get billed a fixed amount. Um, 90 gallons is extremely low water use. I have a family, a family of five. We use 150 to 175 gallons a day typically, which is pretty water efficient. I mean, you know, two or 300 gallons a day is, you know, is not surprising and normal in the city. So 90 is a pretty water efficient rate. But if you if you use 90 or less, you're in, you know, it's 40 bucks a month, um, which is, you know, a good price for, you know, for unlimited water and service. service. Um, so, so that's slide, that's slide 10. Um, slide 11. Um, there, there had been a question at the last meeting about just kind of the customer base profiles. I mean, the, the short version is the city's customer base is extremely skewed residential. Um, it's 90% of the properties are residential. 80% you know, of the money is coming from the residential side. Um, and we're skewed toward metered billing programs. Uh, we have 840,000 accounts, 30,000 are not metered or not on metered billing. Um, you know, the other 810,000 are on metered billing. And if you look at the 30,000 that are not on metered billing, practically all of those are in a special water conservation rate um, that affordable multifamilies can get into where they got to install a meter. So they have a meter, we know what they're using, um, but they also install a bunch of water efficient improvements in most of the apartment units um, in conjunction with the meter. So if they do that, they get a, kind of a special kind of, you know, flat, flat rate price for the building. And even then, um, if, they, if they choose to go and meet it, a lot of them are actually better off. Um, if, if you have a well-maintained, efficient multifamily, um, it can actually be cheaper to be unmetered than to be on the um, kind of the water efficiency rate. So, but then there's just not, it's, it's, it, the cities you look around, it's heavily residential. Meter billing has generally been adopted and embraced. And that, that's, you know, we, have, we do have commercial industrial properties, but it is a heavily residential um, kind of customer profile. So slide 12. Um, we, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but the, these are just the, the steps we go through to kind of do the rate making. Um, the, fir the first, it's about a six month process. The, the first you know, three months are invisible behind the scenes. It's just getting all the different constituencies aligned in terms of what the budget's going to look like and what we want to, what CTEP propose. I'm um, just kind of running all the scenarios and alternatives. Then there's a, you know, a, a you know, two to three month process. It can be as fast as six to eight weeks. It takes place in April to June, which is a public process. The, you know, most of you who pay attention to the water board will be familiar with that kind of, you know, meeting, hearing, meeting cycle um, takes place in, in you know, usually mostly May and June. So that's slide 12. Then um, slide 13, um, we can go on to that. The, we, we, we benchmark ourselves to other cities and we have a, a 30 city peer group um, that our, our rate consultants can help us you know, do the comparison to. And it, the, the, the city rate, the general story with the water and sewer has been the city's water and sewer rates are, they compare favorably to other cities in terms of being more affordable in absolute dollar terms. And that gap has kind of widened over the years, as you, you can see, kind of the discount of our rates compared to peer cities. Um, I, you know, I, I think this, this is a combination of we um, we have a you know, we have a pretty we, we, the DP is a pretty well managed um, utility. We have a very kind of efficiency oriented, kind of cost efficient management team um, who make sure we we you know stay within our budget and you know come in under budget if, if we can. Uh, it's a combination of kind of that management skill in paired with we took a lot of our pain in terms of rate increases in, in the sort of 2005 to 2012 era. So at a time when other cities were not putting through as large rate increases, we took a lot of high rate increases. We used that money to build a lot of projects. And build out a lot of the system and you know, do a lot of interesting things. 
Um, but it's a, it's a combination of kind of the cost efficiency and recent management and the fact that you know in other cities we're not taking large rate increases, you know, we were. So that's that's it. So that's 13. Um, slide 14. Uh, this, this is, we try to, you know, there's a lot going on with the rates in the budget. We, we try to distill it down to what does it mean for a customer, practically speaking, on a monthly or annual term? Like what's the out-of-pocket impact to customers? And th this is kind of a chart and a table we show in our, we showed in our fiscal year 2022 budget and part of our presentation. Um, and it, 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 drill, it drills down to the 2.76%. If you look at, at representative types of customers, Using representative um, amounts of water, it's a couple of bucks a month. It's two to three bucks a month um, for a sort of, infl sort of inflationary type of cost increase. So, um, and, and, and rate increases in, in that sort of in the sort of one to five percent range um, usually are they're sort of inflation plus or minus a bit. Um, usually have a pretty digestible out of out of pocket dollar cost. So, Brian, can we go on to slide fifteen, please? This is it. This is this. this uh, the De Blasio administration did something very important. Um, if you look at our, our history of um, our rates and programs, um, we, we did not it, prior to 2015. The the way we uh, delivered affordability to customers was a focus on we want to run the system efficiently. We want to manage the balance sheet efficiently. We want to keep the costs low, and if we do that, the rate increases will be low. Um, that was that was the philosophy, and it, it was an effective philosophy. Um, that is, it is kind of coming out of the last kind of economic cycle. Kind of the, the interest in kind of targeting affordability, you know, aimed at customers with kind of income profiles where you want to lend a boost or to afford rental housing, you know, grew and grew. And so the board introduced a series of bill credit programs. Um, they started in 2015, they've grown them since then. Um, in, in fiscal year 21, there's a 20, there's $20 million worth of customer affordability. And the board went through a 50% increase last year, boosting it to $30 million. And this, this went from, you know, from zero in 2015 to 30 million this year. So it's, um, it's something that the Blasio administration did a very effective job of. I mean, you know, these are popular programs. They're always subscribed or fully subscri close to fully subscribed. Uh, so if you go to the next one. Uh, so the, the last two slides are just, just to kind of, you know, just kind of, kind of you know, not you know, foreshadowing almost a little bit about of how we how we try to you know, keep track of you know, headlines and you know economic factors in addition to all the kind of inside baseball budgeting and kind of rate schedule work. Um, kind of two things we're looking at right now are um, the as people will know from the newspapers. Um, I mean, inflation is um, the, the sort of you know month over month inflation rates are at a level you haven't seen since 1981. Um, a full year national inflation is seven percent. Um, so it's, it's a striking number, and I mean, it's it's you know for a lot of people to call it. Right? You haven't seen a place like that in your lifetime. This is you. Know, I, I was born in 1978, so <laughs> it's it's close to my lifetime too. Um, but it's 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 a high it's a high number. Seven percent is a um, you know eye catching rate of inflation. Um, you have to kind of wait against all the years of two percent, you know, or sub two percent low inflation we had. But you know, this year is this year, so we're we're watching that number. Um, I tell you, we haven't seen, um, in terms of our own budgets, you know, lots of signs of that coming through yet. Um, but you know, you, it's you can assume that if you know, national inflation is going in a direction, you're going to see that you'll get into the city's budget, into the utilities budget as well. So that's something we are keeping our eye on very closely. Um, in slide 17, um, this is, you know, we we we, we sell the, the bonds we sell are mostly sold at a kind of constant rate of interest. So the, the price of the bonds moves around in the market, they trade up and down. If you buy the bond in the market, the rate of interest you get changes. The cost to us doesn't change. We sold the bond, you know, most of the debt at you know a two or three, four percent rate of interest, you know, 20 years ago. And that's just what it costs, two, three, four percent a year. But every year we're selling new debt and we're always looking to refinance the old debt, you know, with new cheaper debt or just to knock out old expensive securities if we can. And the that 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 means we have to, you know, our partner um, Agency, the Water Authority looks at this you know, constantly every day. This is you know, what they do. Um, they look for changes in interest rates, and the um, there's been a, a very sharp uptick in borrowing rates. Um, I look at I look at like, the U.S. Treasury rates, and like they're the safest you know, borrower. Everything else is benchmarked to them in one way or another, um, and those have gone up by you know a full percentage point since October. And you see that kind of you know, big you know, uptick in the chart there on the right hand side. Um, in context, you got it's, it's still I mean the, these rates are extremely low compared to where things were in 2018, 2019, to say nothing further back. Um, but you know, when, when, you know, when the rates are going up in, you know, on whatever benchmark yield you want to look at, the cost of our bonds is going to get more expensive too. And you do see some of that in the trading. 
um, you know, some of the, the you know, yields on bonds to trade in the secondary market are getting more um, more attractive to the buyer, um, you know, but, but, you know, <laughs> less attractive to the seller. But um, for the, if you're selling new bonds, they are going to be slightly more expensive than they were you know, three or four months ago. They're still extremely affordable compared to where we were even before the pandemic. But again, we watch you know, changes in interest rates very closely. And it, if, as borrowing costs get more expensive, that's going to go in the rate model. is going to be in higher rate increases, all else equal. Um, so that, that, that's it. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, please you know, shout out or you, you feel free to email me. Um, my, so yeah, my email is O-N-A-Z-E-M at dep.myc.gov. Um, a lot of our questions take long written answers to, to, to ask and to answer. So if you want to prefer to email me, that's fine. But um, if anyone has questions, I have to talk about it. Um, thank you so much, Omar. We, we really appreciate you going through such detail for everyone. We did have a, a couple of questions come in through the chat that we'll go through first. And then um, if folks want to ask questions um, verbally, you can use the raise hand feature um, and we'll call on you one by one. Um, but Omar, the, the first question is from Shino and she's asking a, for more details about the flat rate and other rate plans. Um, Brian, if you can go back to that slide, it may have been nine or 10. Uh, I think back a little more. One more. Yes, this one. Thank you. Yeah. So the so the if you go back through the history of the city, the, the way the way property taxes and the way water bills were calculated, and I, I'm talking like like in the 19th century, but it, well into the 20th century too. They were done on what was called frontage and. They didn't have meters. They didn't want to pay people to go in the building. So they would literally just like figure out how far across is your building. You, you got a 12 foot building, you got a 14 foot building, you got an 18 foot building and your property tax, your water bill was based on that. That was kind of version one. Version two was they kind of paired it with, well, you're, you're an 18 foot building with like two or three stories. You pay this, you're one story, you pay this. So um, they, they, that's got, and they, they, of course, phase those out over time. They came up with more sophisticated property tax you know, assessment methods, and they you know, were able to put in meters and track what people actually use and charge them kind of you know, incongruence to you know, this, their use of the system. Um, but we, we still, and those, those are generally rates that you know, we are gradually phasing out. Um, the, we, we do have some old frontage rates still around. Um, there, there's, there's, there's not a lot. I think we have like the 840,000 accounts, I think something like 6,000, or, or it, it goes down by hundreds every year, are still on kind of old frontage rates. And there's, there's always a story to it. Like there's, you have, you have buildings way up in you know, North Manhattan or somewhere in the Bronx where they like literally can't safely install like a meter, like the pipes or like on a cliff or something. And they're like, just, you know, they, they put their bedrock, like some inexplicable reason 60 years ago. And just like, it just isn't worth it. It's too, it's unsafe. It's like these people get built on frontage. Um, so we have some, we have some of that. Um, if you go through, we have, we have some small business subsidy rates, like, you know, bakeries can get a discounted rate, laundromats, your dry cleaners can get a discounted rate where you know, the water costs are you know astronomical and you, you got it. There's businesses you want to see them in the city, right? So. Um, there's some of those, but, but most of the flat rates are not those. They're not French. Most of the flat rates um, of the 30,000 or so, like, you know, say, you know, well, it's, I, I think it's 4,000 in frontage and about you know, 27,000 or so are on um, the multifamily conservation plan rate. And that, that rate is the rate I was describing where you need to have a meter installed. You need to install water efficient faucets and shower fixtures. Um, you've got to be in good standing. And you, if you look at the customers you've got in the program, they usually you know, do fit that profile. And if you, if you do those things, then you can be charged on, it's, it's a per apartment, it's about $1,000 a year per apartment unit. And they can, you know, it helps them in the affordable housing world is helpful, the, you know, the HDFC world is helpful to have that budgeting certainty, just to know my number is this. Now, a, a, a lot of them, if they are water efficient, I mean, a, a water efficient Walmart building, you know, could easily be you know seven hundred six hundred dollars per unit a month for metered billing, and it's not hard to find examples of flat rate buildings where if they flip to metered, they'd save a lot of money. But they just you know they just sometimes buildings want that budgeting, so they'd rather they'd rather pay that higher rate just to know what the numbers in budget and know there's not going to be a shock. They just know that's the number and that's what it is, and that's what most of the flat rate programs are. 
Thanks, Omar. Um, the next question uh, was about a comment you made about um, single family uh, versus uh, multifamily. And so the question is why would a single family residents pay less than households living in apartments? Um, and Brian, this might be, uh, yeah, here. Yeah. So, so this, so this is, so what I'm showing in this chart is, so it, it's a bit of a mix and match here, right? So the, the single family line, the, the thousand dollars a year or so is a metered rate. The multifamily flat rate is a flat rate. That's not metered. If you look at what a sort of typical metered multifamily unit in a well-managed buildings unit is using, they're going to be, they could be six, 700, 800 a year. So the metered water efficient multifamily apartment unit is going to be less than the single family. Um, the single family could be less too. Remember, like if you, my my in-laws, you know, have a single family house in Queens. They, they, there's no kid. They have a dog. The dogs don't you know, do that much. So their their water bills, you know, 450 bucks a year, right? Because they're on that minimum charge. So it's it, and you, it's not if you find single families with a pool and like a large occupancy and they're single families, you're going through two, three, four thousand dollars a year in charges. So it's very much kind of fact specific. But the um the, the sort of typical single family meter for kind of reasonable you know New York City use is a thousand. Um, you know, the flat rate kind of guaranteed, you know, what the number is multifamily rate is slightly higher than that. Um, you know, there is, it, it's, it, it, the reason for that, you know, it, the kind of the well-managed apartment unit should be lower than the single family house, right? So there's, you know, there's some, there's, but that budgeting certainty and kind of the fact that there's, you know, some kind of, you know, buffer there for higher use, um, you know, it's, it kind of gives, gives you, kind of takes you to that number, that, that 1,000 or so for the flat rate um, apartment units. Sorry, can, can, can I clarify? This is not yeah table I was talking about there was a table oh, on a, sure. the preferred unit table yeah, yeah uh no yes this one right and so on average in New York City households living in apartments are lower income than families living in single family properties and so well whether we're talking about like best practices and management etc it looks like effectively what happens is that households living in Lower income households who tend to live in apartments are paying more for their water. Than no, that, that, that's incorrect. That's incorrect. So the okay. this is, so the, the so this is the flat rate. So this so the not the one thousand dollars for the single family properties in the top line is a metered rate. Okay, so you're in a single family. You're not hitting the minimum charge. You're paying a meter. That's a thousand bucks a year per property. The second line is the water efficiency rate. That's the, if you if you're in a, if you saw you say I, I'll install a meter. But I don't want to get billed on metered billing. I want to have the budgeting certainty, and you install those water efficient conservation fixtures I was talking about. Then you're guaranteed that thousand bucks. Now you've got the meter, and if you're there, now a lot of, a lot of properties just say, you know, look, we're going to run the property well. We're going to have you know, a water meter, and we're going to pay, pay on meter charges. I'm not, I don't show it in this chart, but the the average metered charge per apartment unit for a well managed water efficient Multifamily on metered could be six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month. It depends what you want to assume for the for the usage. But if you're in a multifamily and it's well managed, there aren't a lot of leaky hidden pipes inside, and it's water efficient, you're going to be usually two thirds of the single family metered price. But I'm just confirming, manager. I mean, the vast majority of multifamily housing is run by like individual mom and pop landlords. So mm -hmm. I don't know what you mean by well managed here, and like what these landlords ability to detect leaks are, but I guess it would be good to know like the in, in actuality on average, what do single family units pay and what do multifamily units pay? Forget managed, well-managed, not well-managed, but like what effectively what happens? Well, so most, so most, multi, so most, most multifamilies, I, I mean, in New York City landlords in my experience are extraordinarily cost conscious and they're looking at everything out to like six decimals. And you know, mom and pops are in you know some ways the worst about that. So I, you know, I work with a lot of landlords in my in yeah, my, I, I, we, that's not the case. No, I well, I I, I disagree. I, I take usually being 10 to 20 phone calls a day from mom and pop landlords who are asking me about the 10 cent round the error in their bills. So I, I we talk to different landlords. I get a lot of calls from landlords asking me, you know, remedy the 10 cent error in my bills. Um, but that that is if if, if you are if you have water efficient. So first of all, if you're water inefficient and you're wasting money in a building where you can fix the plumbing, you're going to have higher charges. Okay, our, our fundamental billing policy is water use is proportional. Your water your water bill is proportional to how much water you use. 
that's true for everyone. Are you a multifamily? Are you an office building? Are you an industrial building? Are you a small house? Are you a duplex, triplex? That's a basic philosophy of what we do. The only big exceptions to that are if you're a multifamily that installs water efficient fixtures, that almost guarantees you're gonna be water efficient, then you can get a guaranteed rate of a thousand bucks a month. And a lot of properties choose that because they like the budgeting certainty, even though they're worse off. A lot of those properties who pick the fixed rate would be better off on meter, but they pick the fixed rate and pay the higher number just to have that budgeting certainty. The only other big exceptions are if you're very water efficient and use that 90 gallons a day or less, you get that extremely discounted rate of 40 bucks a month, essentially, or if you're one of the small business categories. Um, we, we also, we have, a, we have you know, an endless array of programs we've run over the years. Um, we've had a toilet replacement program. We have a reimbursal metering program. We, you know, cost share, provide advice. We'll do the installations of some of these. We'll tell you which con contractor to use. And we've been doing that since the 90s. I mean, we have 30 years of modern day programs kind of offering landlords any number of incentives to kind of get there, you know, to do the installations and the water efficient stuff, get the consultant in there, check it out. And we have a huge array of tools you can use. Like I, with my own water use, I, I have a spreadsheet where I type in once a week, I go and I type in my water use, I benchmark myself to kind of the numbers we have. I do an analysis by month and season. Um, mom and pop landlords being what they're like often do that too. And I, I hear from them when they call me, you know, 10 or 20 times a day sometimes. Um, so there, there's no shortage of tools to kind of assess and benchmark your own water use. Um, we also have that, we have that peer group of 30 um, cities. We have that in our rate report each year. It's in our bond offering statements. Um, a lot of landlords like to buy our bonds. Of course, they read those things. And it's very easy to kind of benchmark as you're building water efficient compared to other cities or similar properties. Um, then the, the rent guidelines board puts out a big report each year with a line item expense analysis of what's in there. You can see what they're using for their typical water usage. So there's a lot of ways and a lot of resources, a lot of money available to kind of get buildings to a water efficient place and to kind of figure out where you stand in terms of you know, the water kind of use being efficient or not. Um, but the, the base, if you are if you are a metered billing and you aren't, you know, there aren't massive leaks. I mean, uh, you know, most meter, most multifamily buildings using uh, typical rates of water consumption are gonna be two thirds of the typical single family usage, meaning they pay less. And a lot of the ones that choose to pay more on that higher rate are doing so for the budgeting certainty. And you have kind of within that rate, right? You have a lot of kind of, you're, when you design a rate, you're trying to make the rate good overall, right? Like you've got, you know, 100,000 properties in a rate plan and you can't, you can't, in the ideal world, we have a computer, we can price everyone, every property on their perfect, you know, tailored rate. We can't, we have, we design rates to kind of fit a category of properties or fit a, fit a particular fat pattern. And, you know, some properties are better off and some are worse, but, you know, we just, we can't, we can't tailor rates perfectly to every exact set of facts and circumstances. But the, hey, the, Omar, the, hey, yeah. Omar, I'm going to, I'm going to stop you here just because yeah. we're running a little late on time. I see that um, Joe Mirren, our, our agency chief financial officer, um, has a comment. Joe, do you want to chime in? No, I just wanted to clarify because Omar did say a few times cost per month. And I think, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you did mean cost per year. You know, Omar, when you're talking about the, um, the multifamily flat rate per unit. Um, cause it is a like to like comparison. These are annual charges. Um, so I just don't want that to be misconstrued on the record or anything like that. And then I think the other thing too, is that Omar has gone into, I think an excellent level of summarization and detail here, but I think a lot of the questions we're getting now are much more detailed. I think to what he had said earlier, you know, we can take these, you could put them into the chat and we could respond back separately to give, you know, more, you know, thoughtful. And, and again, those will also go out to everyone as well. So they all know that, you know, what the responses are going to be from there. But yeah, I want to, you know, second one, Mikkel said that, you know, thank you, Omar. I think that was an excellent recap. Um, and, you know, I think we do need to just, you know, move it along so that we can get the other topics addressed as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's a great point. And the link that I entered into the chat earlier, um, you'll see that we do a running list of frequently asked questions based on the comments and questions we receive at this meeting. So we are capturing the questions that have been entered into the chat and we will update that document with um, responses to the questions that have come in um, in the last couple of minutes. Um, with that, I do want to transition to Alan Cohn um, in his presentation. For those of you who joined a little bit later, um, 
when Angela first welcomed us, she clarified that this meeting is a little bit different than our standard um, advisory group meetings because we had um, um, questions come in about our current rate setting process. And so um, we're thankful that Omar was able to join us and, and walk us through those details. But we still wanted to give an update on the study and where we are on the study as of now. So Alan Cohn and his team um, will give Give a, a quick update on where we are with the study, and then we'll round out um, with some additional questions. So thanks, Alan. Great. Thank you, Mikkel. Can we go to the next slide, please? All right. So this slide might look familiar um, to those of you that have been on previous calls, um, but just wanted to recap, um, especially for um, those of you that might be joining us um, for the first time. Um, so a sustainable rate structure analysis consists of six primary tasks. Task one is straightforward, just um, project management of the study. Um, task two includes the comparative analysis report, which benchmarks 10 other utilities to gain an understanding of why they chose the rate structure, as well as a collection of information regarding each city's customer affordability um, programs. Um, that is the sub was the subject of our um, meeting prior meeting and is available as I think I said earlier on our website um, the link which you pasted in the chat um, task three is the development of the storm uh, the system revenue requirements um, which is what it costs to provide service today and projections over the next 20 years um, and the allocations of these costs by water sewer and storm water task four is where the five great options are model modeled and that's what I'm going to go into more detail in a minute. Um, this includes determining what the actual rates and charges would be for each of the rate options. Um, for instance, what a fixed rate um, charge would be by, by meter size, but I'll give some other examples. Uh, task five examines the impacts of the rate options on actual customers. In other words, how much of a change a customer would see in their bill um, with each rate structure option. This task also includes considering how the rate structure options might be phased in over time. Um, and finally, this task includes completion of an affordability analysis, um, which includes an assessment of customer bills as a percentage of income for each census tract. Um, lastly, we will um, provide the final report and recommendations for the study, study in task six. Next slide, please. So this is another slide that um, likely looks um, familiar um, to many of you, um, but this outlines the rate structure, some of the rate structure goals that were included in the scope of work for our study. That's a lot of things you've already heard, um, balancing competing needs, uh, including state of good repair, level of service, climate resiliency, water conservation, uh, promoting equity and customer affordability amongst customer classes based on characteristics of service and demographics, um, promoting rate and revenue stability, um, achieving a reasonable correlation between cost of service and usage, um, and achieving compatibility with DEP's new billing system, um, so ease of implementation um, from a billing and customer service uh, perspective, plus flexible ongoing maintenance. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So this is the um, from the comparative analysis, um, which I just mentioned a second ago, and which is available um, on our website and was the subject of the um, advisory group meeting. Um, so as demonstrated in this table, uh, fixed charges and stormwater charges are very common amongst those included in our survey. Um, fixed charges are extremely common within the utility industry and were mentioned as a source of revenue stability for a lot of the cities. Um, stormwater charges are also common, uh, but do require proper planning um, for implementation. Uh, one of the primary benefits is that the charges align um, the cost of providing stormwater management with the use of the system, um, since they're based on impervious area. Development investment charges are less common, um, particularly for urban areas, um, but there are some that have implemented these changes. Um, and finally, uh, several cities mentioned the adoption of an affordability rate design in the form of a lifeline rate, um, which has been effective to provide affordability um, and generate support for necessary increases in water rates. Next slide, please. Um, so very briefly, the slide lists the rate structure options to be analyzed in the study. Um, there are four primary rate options with a fifth that includes um, any combination, the combination of the other four. Um, and the next slide um, outline each of the rate options in more detail. So next slide. 
So this, out, this slide outlines the key aspects of fixed charges. Um, fixed charges, again, are very common within the utility industry um, as they provide revenue stability um, and reflect the, the fact that the utility incurs costs in having service ready and available, um, whether it is used or not. Um, fixed charges are collected regardless of metered water use and are set to recover a portion of fixed costs, including administrative and readiness to serve. Um, they're typically scaled by meter size um, to reflect potential demand on the system. That is, the larger the meter size, the higher the fixed fee. Um, over the past decade or so, many utilities have been increasing um, the portion of revenue generated from fixed charges to help offset declining demands and stabilize revenues. And fixed charges are typically set to recover between 10 to 30 percent of system revenue requirements. Uh, shown on the right here is an example from Philadelphia, um, where again the charges are scaled by meter size, um, which reflects the potential use of it. So this slide outlines the key aspects of a stormwater charge. Um, as many of you may know, stormwater charges have become increasingly common among cities as they look to address the increasing costs associated with stormwater management. Um, currently, uh, our stormwater management costs are covered through our sewer rates. Uh, stormwater charges are typically assessed based on the amount of impervious area of a parcel. Um, therefore, more impervious area results in greater runoff and contribution to the system, and therefore a higher cost. There will be a significant amount of consideration um, given to how the stormwater charge is structured um, to allow for administration of the charge um, for example, um, tiers of impervious area are often Im implemented to allow for simplicity. Um, and this is shown in the example on the right um, from the city of Baltimore, um, which maintains a fairly simplistic stormwater charge structure um, with single family properties assessed based on tiers of imperviousness and all other property types based on measured impervious area. Um, cities can also provide uh, credits uh, for property owners to reduce impacts to the system. Um, for example, uh, removal of impervious area and installation of green infrastructure. One thing to note um, is that there is no currently no en enabling legislation within New York State for stormwater charges, um, with only the city of Ithaca having established a stormwater charge today. Next slide, please. So this slide <clears throat> outlines the key aspects of a development investment charge. Um, development investment charges are similar to impact fees um, in that they're intended to recover a portion of the cost of constructing the assets necessary to provide service. Um, development investment charges provide alignment with cost of service and provide additional funds to meet capital needs of the system. Um, shown here uh, for DC, this is a, a one-time charge that is assessed based on the size of the customer connection, um, which corresponds to the meter size. So finally, this slide outlines the key aspects of rate options for low-income customers. Um, a lifeline rate is simply a reduced rate for the first quantities of water, um, with that quanti quantity defined um, as the minimum amount for basic indoor water needs. <clears throat> um, lifeline rates assist with affordability of, of water service and encourage the, the wise use of water resources. Um, and during the comparative analysis, uh, the cities that had implemented um, a lifeline rate mentioned that it had been an effective tool for them. Um, City of San Francisco, one of the examples shown here, um, offers a lifeline rate to single family and multifamily customers. Um, note that one CCF is 100 cubic feet or 748 uh, gallons. And next slide, please. All right, so given those options, um, the slide shows where we are in the study and next steps. Um, we're currently wrapping up uh, task three, um, the development of revenue requirements and allocations for each service type, um, water, sewer, and stormwater. We started on task four um, with the processing of all the customer data that will be required um, to model the various rate structure al alternatives. Um, the rate structure options will be modeled um, with and without um, separate uh, stormwater charge, uh, and you can click once more. Um, finally, we'll consider um, the, actually keep, keep uh, clicking um, once more. If you click 
get through to the end now, I'll tell you when it's not blue. Right, next time I won't animate my slides. <laughs> um, finally, we'll consider the hybrid option, um, which will be a combination of other options. Um, in terms of uh, overall schedule, um, task four is, is scheduled for completion by uh, early fall of this year um, and will be uh, the primary focus of, of the next of several months. So as always, um, we'll continue to provide updates um, as the study progresses. And with that, I will pass it uh, back to Mikkel for questions and next steps. Um, thanks, Alan. So um, in terms of where we are in the current study, are there any questions for Alan and the um, slides he just shared? Again, you're welcome to put them in the chat or um, use the raise hand feature. Okay, so in, in terms of next steps, um, we do plan to come back to you later in the year um, after we continue the progress in the study that Alan mentioned. Um, so please stay tuned. We'll also be updating the website with today's presentation, um, the updated Q&A with the questions that came in for Omar um, and other links that will be helpful for those of you are, that are just starting to follow along with us. If this was your first, um, your, your first introduction to the sustainable rate structure study, highly encourage you to check out the first presentation that we gave. Um, and I'm also seeing um, questions coming in about potentially having one-off meetings with us. We're happy to come and to chat with anyone about the study and the work that we're doing. Um, as we mentioned early on, uh, we do anticipate and hope to have a lot of feedback um, from this advisory group and from other communities as well, um, so that by the time is the study is complete, we've been very open and transparent about our findings. Um, I'm seeing, before I close out, I'm seeing one more question from Herschel. Um, are there any benefits besides equity in creating a stormwater charge? I don't know if, if Angela or Alan want to take that as, as we've given that some thought over the years. Sure, Angela, do you want me to start? Sure, um, yeah, or I could take it. Um, and Alan, you know, please chime in. So the benefits as we see them are really to incentivize the proper behavior. Omar mentioned earlier on that um, sometimes when we adopt um, rates or we think about our rate structure, we think about how do we incentivize the type of conservation that we want, which is demand reduction. Um, and in this case, this would be something that would help us to manage stormwater at the source. Um, we would give credits potentially for folks who could do green infrastructure on their sites. And, and that's the theory behind it. And that's what we need to evaluate is what that um, rate might look like and how well do we think it would incentivize this type of behavior. Um, because one thing to note is that the city is really um, well out in front on stormwater management. We just adopted a new rule for unified stormwater management. Um, whenever a property is um, redeveloped uh, 20,000 square feet or greater, we will require on-site stormwater management. We have a retrofit program that has been launched and we're trying to encourage people to retrofit that way. So even before and even if um, in lieu of I should say, um, a potential stormwater fee, we are looking to incentivize this. But Herschel, that would essentially be the purpose of it. Thank you, Angela. Um, and one more question from Shino. How do we pass on affordability to low-income residents who don't own their property? So Shino, you know, I, I think you're you're likely talking about renters who may not see a water bill, but 
um, who may experience um, the impacts of rate changes um, as a, you know, in their rent or through other fees. Is that right? Okay. Um, Angela, I, I'll pass that back on to you as well, because I know your team has um, thought about this, especially in regards to our rate increases in comparison to other utilities that are more dominant on the property owner versus tenant side. Right, so this, this one is really tricky. First and foremost, it's very difficult for a municipality to do income verification on its own. It, it's something that the city um, and, and this department would be very reluctant to do. So we want to rely upon other qualifications, other places where people may have already been income um, qualified when we look at this customer class. But with respect to the renters, and this city is predominantly renter occupied, we're over 60% renters. So this, this is a curious issue and, and something that we haven't solved. Um, and I will just give you a just quick aside, which is that the federal government put funding under the low income um, household water assistance program, and that is being currently administered by the New York State's um, Office of Temporary Disability Assistance. And even they are having um, some issues associated with how do they reimburse anybody that isn't a homeowner. So like a renter, for instance, um, if you're not the owner occupier, how do you actually um, compensate somebody who might be paying a high bill in that case? Um, the theory is a bit trickle down so that if the property owner gets a break, do they then give the renter a break not sure, but all, or do they actually put some additional funding maybe into the property? So maybe repairs that haven't been getting done. Um, it is possible that renters could see some um, relief from that perspective as well. So for an answer directly to the question, we really don't know exactly how to get that done. Um, just generally speaking, uh, we are looking at potentially down the road doing more apartment metering. So that is something that Alan, I know we have spoken about, um, Alan is on my team, and we have um, something that we have considered whether or not as apartments are either renewed or as buildings are renewed and refreshed, do we require submetering? In that way, renters may have more protection and a better understanding of the type of water use that they use vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors. And that would be something maybe that landlords would start to pay attention to and really incentivize. It wouldn't be something that the city would read. We would still read the building meter. Um, that's where we're comfortable for now. But this is something that could help renters protect themselves. So more, more it's, it's a wonderful question. Um, I want to study it further myself, and um, definitely we'll circle back on this one. Thank you, Angela. And um, Herschel, I, I do see the question that you just entered about stormwater fee and behavior change. I would like to save this one for our FAQ because this is, you know, one of the tensions that the study is looking at um, as we look at, you know, if you were to implement a stormwater fee, how large would it have to be to um, change behavior? We've seen some other um, municipalities do so, and we and we have data on that that we'll provide um, in more detail um, when we circulate information on that um, when we get that far in the study, um, but also in the FAQ that we're doing. So with that, I'm going to close out our meeting and say thank you everyone for participating. We know that we went through a lot of very dense and detailed information. Omar, thank you for coming on behalf of the, the Water Board and in response to the advisory group's question. Um, and we look forward to sending you all of the background material um, and we'll see you again in a couple of months with more updates on the study's progress. Thank you very much, everyone, and, and have a great rest of the day.